So you are the general manager of workplace and change mm -hmm. at Lendlease. That's true. Tell us what that means. Uh, it means I wear about three different hats, actually. Uh, I spent my whole career, I, I trained as a psychologist, but I spent mm -hmm. my whole career thinking about work and place and the interaction between people and the built environment, effectively. Mm -hmm. And really, I've spent a lot of that time w worrying about work and researching about how work is changing and helping customers like big end users of space, uh, large corporates, uh, large tenants of all kinds, trying to work out what to do with their workplace of the future, how to conceive of their property portfolio of the future. So I still do that for lots of lend lease customers. Um, I also, the other hat that I would wear is say that lend lease is one of my customers. So I look after all the workplaces for lend lease around the world, mm. which is very exciting. I have to kind of, you know, take my own advice and sip my own champagne and live mm -hmm. in some of our projects. And then finally, we're very interested in the user experience and the workplace of the future driving the design of our newest buildings. Mm. So how might we take what we've learned by doing the workplace work and actually design for that, mm. rather than just doing what we did before, which, you know, our property sector is sometimes slow to innovate and we've decided to try and speed that up and be quicker. Yeah, so you mentioned researching work. Mm -hmm. How do you actually do that? A number of ways. We, we listen and talk to people who use the space and people who work, uh, big corporates and what drives them. And we work, uh, we observe a lot of what happens in workplaces, what's happening. We've got, over the last five years, we've taken 1.7 million observations of workplace um, hmm. in Australia and all in Singapore as well which is it's absolutely fascinating. So you can see changes happening, what people are doing in the space, how the space is used, how much space is not used is kind of the shock. On average, around 50% of office space is completely empty at any given moment. At any given time, mm -hmm. even during the working hours. Between 8.30 and 6.30 p.m. Huh, how can that be? Well, people are more mobile than they've ever been, as you'd imagine, through technology. Sure. Um, they're working in different locations. Most people have a network of spaces in their lives. You know, you might do a little bit of work with customer. Mm -hmm. You might be having a meeting somewhere else. Um, you may even be traveling or working from home. Sometimes it's an option for some mm -hmm. careers. So that accounts for some of it. You've got about 5% of sick leave and annual leave as uh -huh. well. So there's bits and you can it quickly goes down. But it's amazing how we might have, as a big organization, a very expensive resource and half of it yeah. is completely redundant. Right, so is that taken as good news from Lendlease because you're saying that they can use their space more effectively? Or, I mean, Lendlease, as an office developer, probably doesn't want to hear that they could theoretically do with half as much product or their clients might be able to use less, right? Yeah, I think we're only here for our customers. We don't need to talk them into Doing it using you know more space than they have uh, today or less. We we just want to do what they really need. When I see the the research that tells us that 50% of the space is underutilized, I just see opportunity. Hmm. So if they're not there, where are they? And what might we provide mm -hmm. inside that space in the building or in the precinct that they really need? Um, is there an opportunity to change the way we use our work, or the way we design our workplaces? so that it does have the things people need? Um, or is that redundancy really required? You know, we, maybe there's some shift work happening and so forth. It, it's an interesting piece of research that throws up more questions and answers mm -hmm. quite often, sure. but always leads us to a place of how might we transform this business using design and real estate. And how have you started to answer some of those questions? I mean, what sort of new uses could you put that space towards? Yeah, so our head office here in Sydney, uh, Lendlease, ha has a big cafe and an event center right in the middle of it. So we were able to take some of our underutilized space and repurpose it for places where people can really come together. Hmm. We felt that it was a fantastic opportunity for us to bring not just ourselves together as a business, but other people too. So we might have uh, conferences mm -hmm. or um, events. We've recently had an indigenous art exhibition <laughs> up there. We do charity drives and then we just sometimes get together and drink coffee. You know, there's a proper working cafe and events program. Yeah, and a public space. Yeah, you can come into and enjoy as part of the Lendlease guest, the Lendlease <laughs> family. Um, and that's how we've decided. And we see a lot of our corporate clients going towards spaces that really genuinely draw people in hmm. over and above the kind of private desk and the private office 
real social space. Like what? What are some other examples of that? Yeah, so cafes happen a lot. Innovation hubs are becoming increasingly important for some it, of the more traditional businesses. It sounds interesting. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, they're spaces that are, are reconfigurable for different types of activity that are around uh, idea generation and execution. So you might have space one day that's set up to do brainstorming and workshopping, reconfigure the next day to try and filter and scan through what those ideas are and then execute on those projects. These are dynamic studio-like spaces really and they're reset and recut kind of every day. Very mm -hmm. dissimilar to most traditional workplace. Mm. So innovation hubs are, are a great idea. Um, obviously social space is probably the other primary user use mm -hmm. of that kind of repurposed space in workplace. It's a whole new set of choices that we just wouldn't conceive of in workplaces maybe even 20 years ago. What else are you hearing from your clients about the new ways that they're using office space and how are you responding to it? Yeah, so in Australia we've seen an enormous rise in activity-based and shared type workplace strategies. That, in put very simply, has people much more free range than they might have been in the past where they have a fixed desk or a fixed office. Now there is a range of settings and people wander among, they don't own any of them, they use the ones they need to give them the activity, hence activity-based workplace. Australia is one of the leading countries and working populations who use this type of workplace strategy and it's been going probably now 10 years maybe um, around that area in this, in this country which is really interesting. So we can see over the long term whether shared workplace strategies like that work or what works mm -hmm. and what doesn't work so well which is really interesting. We're seeing now a little kind of evolution or maturing of the activity-based or shared workplace whereby it's really evolving to become a little bit more people focused than activity focused. What does that mean exactly? So in activity-based working each furniture typology would describe an activity hmm. so working alone quietly concentrating uh, working together with one other or working together as a team for three examples so you would depending on the activity you wanted to do you'd go to that furniture setting sure a desk or a yeah. table with two chairs or a round exactly. table but what we're finding over long periods of time is people think less in terms of activities than we first thought and hmm. more in terms of who they want to work with or near hmm. so people are very social animals mm -hmm. so whether i want to concentrate or collaborate is secondary to me wanting to sit near you <laughs> because we're a team. Yeah. So what happens in these free range workplaces, people start to move as a pack <laughs> rather than, you see, they've been attracted to each other. So we're seeing a new raft of workplaces now really designed around the pack. If people are gonna do that anyway, so let's, let's design for that team and then and go from you there. You said a free range workplace, what is that? look like? It's what we call team-based working. We have it here in Sydney in our head office, as I mentioned before. We've been really happy to be pioneering this. Um, we have we have learned lessons too, so it's not all been perfect, but we design, it's as if we're designing for a family. Mm -hmm. So every team has a kitchen table, <laughs> like a wooden table, just the place you come, you kind of ping back to and you see your family every day. Uh -huh. Um, we move around the table, so it's pretty, it really is like a kitchen table, you sit in any, any seat. And then once you've kind of checked in in the morning, maybe done some kind of routine tasks, you may then spill into more meeting spaces, of course. Or when the kitchen table isn't suitable for your, t I mean, sometimes my kitchen table gets a bit rowdy. You know, yeah, the kids sure. are kind of finished their homework and I need to <laughs> finish an email or whatever. So I, you need spaces that are a release valve from the kitchen table. So we've mm -hmm. given a couple of extra choices. Um, a very quiet space and a more relaxed kind of meeting space. So does that mean that people don't have their own individual desks? They don't. We have tables for teams. Mm -hmm. We have your, you own it as a team, but you don't own it as an individual. I could definitely see the potential upsides of that, but are people upset that they don't have their own space to keep their own stuff? I think when it is a very free range office, more so than a team based office, when it's very free range, like a hot desking type of environment, people f do feel a little displaced. And we have been through that sort of change management process where you're explaining the, the benefits of it. In team based working, we find there's a lot less anxiety because you're still with the right people. Hmm. At the end of the day, you're coming back to the table every day mm -hmm. and you can sit in the same point if you want. It, there's a team of 10 of you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter so much. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had as much change management. There's been a less sense of displacement than you'd imagine. Hmm. Mm. What do you make of the whole rise and fall kind of the idea of the open office? 
because it was all the rage. Oh, yes. Then it's, there was so much pushback. Where are we at now? The open office is like this most polarizing topic right. in the planet, right? <laughs> it's either the devil's work yeah. or it's the best thing I've ever had. I think the open plan is an umbrella term mm -hmm. for so many different designs and strategies, really. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's like describing, you know, sandwich. You know, it really <laughs> depends what's in the sandwich mm -hmm. to how that is a good or bad experience. So what um, makes a good open office or open plan? A and great, what makes a bad one? Yes, a great open office tends to be obviously flooded with light and genuinely a healthy, nice place to be. But what the main concerns and complaints we hear about workplaces of all kinds is when people have low amounts of choice. Hmm. If you are forced to do something, whether it's good, bad, beautiful, light, healthy or otherwise, if you're forced into that condition, you will tend to be less satisfied with it. Um, I, you know, I sit under an air conditioning vent and it blows down my neck. Now, if that person could move, they would never make that complaint because mm. they would quickly realize they were cold and move. It's all of those things where people have choice. Mm. There seems to be more satisfaction for sure, and mm. they're able to adapt their work and their lifestyles to whatever it is. So, I, open plan is kind of demonized, <coughs> but where there is open plan with some choices, it can be quite a quite a, a relatively rewarding place to be. So, how do you give people choice without? just having it be chaos in the office. Well, we have to remember we're designing for adults, firstly, and most mm -hmm. people want to succeed at work, and chaos, you know, they don't need controlling as much as we might think they do. Sure. People will t tend to find a way to work very well. But where we have our team-based workplaces and where workplaces work best is when those choices are available everywhere. So there's not a big kind of giant rush in the morning for the best desk by the window and all of that kind of, right. you're not running to find your favorite uh, desk. We create ample choice so it really becomes a genuine choice. Um, enable people to use it and critically give them the right technology so that they can move between the places. And again, like I say, we're designing for adults. They'll find, they'll find the right way to succeed. And at its best, a workplace will enhance and optimize the way people work and not be a hindrance and add extra processes. A lot of this is about the interiors. Mm. Um, is there something that architects and developers can do at the building scale that can anticipate and respond to some of these changes in the office? Absolutely. I can't, I can't say how much they could do. I could yeah. talk for another hour Let's on give us some this examples. whole idea. I, at the moment, uh, you know, I'm talking an awful lot. The next big thing in workplace is place itself. When you talk to end, people of any kind who work in office buildings, they want to work in a great locale, a great precinct. And creating a great place is probably the, one of the best moves you can do as a business owner moving your business into somewhere which is an activated place which really connects with people in their lifestyle. So um, a place that has got you know, street life, great retail, terrific food and beverage, that really, it's a place you meet, no, 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 you come to me, you know, mm -hmm. I've got this great bar name, you know, that mm -hmm. place is the workplace of the future is my view. And so place making becomes a, a, key, a key element of commercial development and it's mm -hmm. not often thought of. You know, we think of the right. shiny new tower with potentially its lobby cafe and that's it. Every building is a precinct waiting to happen is mm. my kind of, my mm. call to arms for developers, definitely. Well, a lot of new office towers are in office parks or, you know, they're, they're trying to create the neighborhood mm. or the precinct all their own. And I don't think of a suburban office park as much of a place at all. No, so you're I, talking about something entirely different. Exactly, and if you see some of the tech giants who created these office parks, um, you know, in the U.S. and the U.K. and all over the world, I'm sure, um, those companies are now coming back to the city, mm -hmm. or, or some of them are at least. Sure, in or, Silicon Valley, at Google and Facebook, and, and the and very Apple. least, some of they are reinvigorating their presence in the city. I'm not sure they're shrinking necessarily in the yeah. Silicon Valley, but they still they have are. their big campuses in the suburbs, but I they also so. have a city office. Yes, but the city office is becoming so important because it's easy to get to because all the transport flows into the middle of the city and if you want to attract the best talent you want to make their life easy so being on a transit and I don't know if you've ever gone to Silicon Valley it's very no, difficult actually. to get to mm -hmm. very difficult to get to and the traffic's quite quite tough out there mm -hmm. so being in the city center where there's good mass transit which is fantastic it's also a lively place in its own right mm -hmm. the days of the gated community hmm. where it's just us it's kind of it's kind of going I think Big tech and most big businesses want to be with their customers, with other businesses that they can work with. We all know a great place when we see it, and it tends to be diverse 
and activated. And cities do that, which is fantastic. So mm -hmm. the gated campus and the manufactured business park is going to probably take a look at itself on where its role lies in the future. Yeah. That makes sense. But those are all things that are outside of the physical scope of the building. So mm -hmm. how about inside the office itself? How do you make people yes. happy to be there? Because most people, even if they love their job, don't necessarily love their office. I hear it all the time. So um, yes, I, I hate my office. I can't wait to get mm -hmm. out. And, and I think it is, that's why I do the work that I do. When we're putting a building together, there are ingredients which makes it a much more positive experience. Um, I'm a big advocate where it's possible to have a side core building. That means everyone coming out of the lift is having the same experience. It's not like a donut of space around a central core. Mm. A side core experience means you can walk straight into a social space, which mm. is great, which connects that team together. You can navigate really well by seeing the whole floor plate in front of you. Right. I'm an advocate for the deepest penetration of natural light we can get. Uh -huh. So we don't want buildings that are too skinny, but we absolutely want buildings that have got great natural light. Ideally, some aspect. Not every building has a great view yeah. out of it. Not every floor has a great view out of it. But if you can see something natural and see a long view and see some sky even, it makes a big difference to your sense of well-being. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a healthy building mm -hmm. is a great is a, we have to be advocates for that at Lendlease. We, um, we are mandated to have the highest sustainability credentials that we possibly can, and that brings along with it a lot of good things for people. Mm -hmm. So that's 100% fresh air. We don't recycle any of the air in the buildings hmm. in Barangaroo, for example, hmm. and we won't do in Circular Key Tower. Using natural um, or very sustainable products means they're not off-gassing and we're not breathing in. Mm -hmm anything toxic, which is fantastic. So these things that we do for sustainability have a wellness aspect to the actual end users that's probably unaccounted for in the budget of the building and, mm -hmm. and how it's put together, but in the long-term use of it is critical. You mentioned Barangaroo, that's your mm -hmm. new office, right? Yes, we have our Lenley's headquarters there. It's a three-tower development, just kind of up the road from mm -hmm. where we're sitting now in Sydney in Australia, and it's 360,000 square meters of uh, commercial space and about 15,000 of retail underneath, with around 200 apartments currently. And how did you apply some of the things we've been talking about, about the, the new nature of work and office space into that project? It's a, great, it's a great development to showcase a little bit of our thinking around placemaking in particular. So the retail strategy has been um, not executed by myself, by the wonderful team at Lonely. It's just been really beautifully put together. The vision was to create a, a global food destination. Hmm. So really to pull together, I mean, well, when you think about what that really means, you it doesn't mean branded restaurants, it means real beautiful produce by you know, artisans pretty much. So the team there handpicked the restaurants that are down there, of which there are very many now. I would be probably underestimating what I'm saying, 30 odd restaurants, which is incredible. Hmm. Um, the boutiques and the shops retail down there are all largely curated. So they're a mixture of designers and uh, objects and things that you might be able to purchase. So it's a very fun experience. Mm -hmm. It means there's a lot of footfall through Barangaroo, which is just a nice exploration of laneways and more wider boulevards and then the waterfront. So this sense of scale, I always say in development, it's what you don't build that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. The spaces that are narrow and wider and where you let people linger and um, kind of congregate, which is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. So Barangaroo, it's uh, not fully open yet, but mm -hmm. the signs are, we're 90% there, and it's, um, it's a really exciting place to be a part of. Mm -hmm.